So I'm here with Hervoye Bogunovic of Optima. Uh, it's the Department of Ophthalmology at the Medical University of Vienna. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hervoye, you gave a great lecture yesterday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Here at Arvo. Uh, really stunning. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it was all about basically artificial intelligence and OCT. Right. Uh, really mesmerizing. And just tell me a little bit more about the gist of your talk and and why artificial intelligence uh, is kind of at the innovative cutting edge of uh, OCT. Right. So I think, you know, nowadays you're really kind of uh, experiencing that artificial intelligence is really reaching the performance that it can really kind of start transforming the world around us. You know, we have it, you know, on the Amazon Echo, you see it on Facebook, you see the Google, no doubt. what it can do. So, you know, it's it's kind of natural to also start to think about, okay, what can it actually do in, in, in healthcare? And because we work in ophthalmology, then for us, of course, it's a big interest and how can we kind of leverage all this uh, power behind the, these new technologies in AI, especially the deep learning, you know, uh, how can it analyze all the OCT images, which kind of present so much information, which is almost impossible for, for clinicians to kind of uh, manually look through and, and, uh, and see what's all information that is in there. Right. So, you know, like it's, it's really something that we are on the, on the cusp of kind of trying to really make the AI work for us. And it sounded like you could use it to kind of predict disease. Right. So we are focusing really on this kind of aspect of predictive medicine. You know? So you can think of it about as if when you have like a hurricane season and then, you know, they want to kind of understand where the where the landfall is going to be. And so you have this kind of a conus or a triangle of kind of understanding where the possible paths that a hurricane can take. In the same way, like we try to think about, uh, the same way we think about it on, uh, for the disease and kind of trying to understand, you know, how disease is going to progress. To kind of to kind of limit this uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future, because currently many of these treatments, you know, we really don't know how well they will work on a patient, whether the patient will respond and how well it will respond. So we really want to kind of understand uh, better, like what is going to happen in the future, even either in the case of the treatment or even with the natural progression. So we really focus about the disease progression. Yeah, and uh, you know, based on your presentation, are you finding that you know when artificial intelligence combines with OCT? Currently, uh, today, you, you can predict with some accuracy who is going to have disease? Yeah, definitely. I mean, before, you know, people e either didn't do these type of tasks or the task was very kind of subjective. But now we can really utilize the, the wealth of information provided by OCT to, very have, a, to have a very precise characterization of the retina. And, uh, and with that, we really see that like the performance is, uh, I mean, number one, of course, because it's an automated system, it's very objective. So it doesn't really matter in what type of day, you know, it makes its prognosis. Uh, it's, it's always, you know, kind of acts in a very consistent way. And, uh, and we do see that we pick, it picks up in performance, which maybe it's not ready for the clinical use already. But, you know, if, if we kind of still improve it a bit, we hope that it, it eventually will provide a good kind of second pair of eyes, you can think of it about to the clinic and kind of provide a second opinion about what might happen with the, with the patient. Yeah. Um, and can you recall anything from your presentation in terms of sort of a specific example that shows um, maybe for a particular disease, but, you know, just a concrete example of how it's working today and, and it can be used? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... For, it's like a multiple thing. So number one, it's it's really precise in terms of now identifying lesions. Yeah. So we can really use it to f to not only say whether lesion is present or not, but actually to quantify it in a very precise manner. This was simply not possible without these tools because. People, uh, clinicians, they don't have time to manually annotate in all of these lesions on, on every single slice of the OCT. So this is really, I think, something that is going to transform because they will start to rely on this type of measurements because right now these measurements simply don't exist. So it's really something that brings the whole practice to a bit of next level. Hmm. So I would say this would probably be the most... Uh, the, be the best example that I can really see that we have some technology which is really ready to be used because these segmentation algorithms are now really at the performance which a few years ago was simply not imaginable. We were really struggling with these type of tasks in this classical um, uh, computer vision, let's say, applications up to the, the moment where the deep learning really showed that, uh, you know, given enough data sets and given enough these kind of labels and given enough computational power, we can really achieve performance that actually equals then the, the human performance uh, at the very same task. Well, you mentioned humans, and I, I believe there was a question about, you know, I, I guess humans have to get deep learning off the ground to begin with. Yeah. So you have to sort of provide certain right. physician-based parameters for the deep learning to yeah. occur. But once it's set up, 
uh, the machine learning can go deeper and, and do the computations on its own, is that right? Right, yeah. So it does require still quite some effort and actually it's quite some, I would say, um, responsibility on the even on the clinical side to actually, pro you really need a good expert to actually provide these labels for you. So it really has to be an interdisciplinary uh, or multidisciplinary effort. And that's why I think in our, in our group in Optima, I think we are kind of privileged because we really work sort of hand in hand with the, with the doctor. So I'm actually a computer scientist by, uh, in my background, so my, by my degree. So, you know, I really need to kind of combine these two disciplines because for them, it's also important to understand what, are, what machine learning and deep learning can nowadays do for them. And for us also actually to, to, to get the feedback from them about what are the, the, the applications that actually needs to be solved. And, but, and, and, uh, and also to, for them to actually supply us with the, with the expert annotations, which are quite hard to get by. Fascinating. And can you tell me if, if what you're doing can be applied to different types of OCT platforms? Because we'll be talking about swept source OCT, uh, spectral domain OCT. Uh, can all of these work hand in hand? Right, yeah, that's a very good question. Something that we actually have to explore ourselves. So we haven't, for example, worked much with swept source OCT yet. But basically, a lot of this knowledge has already been created by uh, training on the on the on the on the on the uh, spectral domain OCT can sort of be reutilized and then sort of fine tuned for the particular, uh, uh, let's say, uh, modality or particular brand or the, of the device manufacturer. So yeah. it can it still has to be sort of uh, fine tuned on the particular device, but it can still benefit from a lot of uh, annotations that you already have, which have been done on the standard, let's say, spectral domain. So how many years out would you say before routine clinical use involves uh, predictive models based on artificial intelligence in OCT? Yeah, that's, that's another very good question, of course. Uh, it's very hard to make yeah, those kind of, those kind of predictions. Sure, uh, but you're doing it today. Yeah, but so I'm doing speak. it, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I would say, you know, it, it, it starts, on, it first needs to, it needs to be shown that it's actually solving a relevant clinical, you know, task sure. because currently they are simply not used to actually do these kind of predictions because it's not something they do in the clinic. Yeah. So first of all, it's kind of important to sh that, that we realize that these type of predictions are actually important uh, and, and that they are somehow prove themselves to be valid in the future and it will also sort of how, somehow start building trust in them because otherwise the thing, you know, if you see that just like with weather forecast, if it's not really working well, then at some point you're not going to really rely on it sure but once you really see that you know it's, it's, it's really look like it's not going to rain but it end up raining and that's what for forecast said is what it would happen that really kind of started building trust in the into the forecast so that's why I would say you know it's, it's it's I would say maybe five years yeah five to seven years it's somehow but it still it still needs some time yeah and do you think it could be applied to different disease states like uh, macular degeneration uh, retinitis pigmentosa I mean is, is everything open basically yeah, so I don't have experience uh, in, in, in a, a large diversity of these diseases, but so we work mostly with AMD and I would say that the AMD is a very nice nice example because it has actually kind of these multiple stages. So it goes from this uh, early to intermediate and then later to advanced and then currently because there's actually not, not much treatment available so we can somehow really try to, to observe this natural progression of the, of the disease and then try to build these predictive models that can kind of tell us how this disease is going to progress and then when it reaches the, the stage where actually the the ter treatment is available, we can then put in these re different risk groups, the patients who actually can will benefit from this treatment so that, you know, they can kind of be more scheduled on a more frequent basis and then make sure that when the late stage occurs that they are, you know, ready to start receiving treatment as soon as possible. Because we also realize that many of this uh, vision loss happens because people simply start to get treated uh, very far uh, or late in the, in, the, in the disease and then at that time, like most of the vision is already lost, so it's very hard to recover it. But if you can the people you know at the very early onset then you can start the treatment very early and then we see very good benefits of these drugs so once again it comes down to prophylaxis is better than treatment so to speak oh, that's early. that's always always yeah. the case I think across across medical <laughs> domain and diseases I would say right. yeah great Herbollier. well we salute your efforts at yeah. Time magazine thank you so much yeah thanks for a uh, pleasure to fine with us and yeah. enjoy the day thank you so much and you too as well